Welcome. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy, and welcome to our weekly Wednesday webinar series called BizHack Live, where we bring some of the best minds in marketing and storytelling and online lead generation uh, to the fore to share with you, uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, how to move your business forward. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing from the amazing Dave Bricker. Uh, he's going to be talking about the power of business storytelling. Um, the Q&A is open. Dave is asked that we address your questions at the end. Um, so uh, send your questions as they come to you, and I'll be there uh, to be able to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, my name, as I mentioned, is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder of BizHack Academy. My background is as a journalist of more than 15 years. I worked at some of the top publications and news outlets in the country. I also have a broadcast background. So these BizHack Live webinars are really familiar and exciting to me. I love being live. I love being with you uh, vicariously and remotely, uh, since that's what's safe right now. I in 2013, pivoted my career into digital marketing, and I had a very bumpy and long learning journey uh, to get and learn these key lead generation tactics, which now we compress into our uh, webinars and into our five-week accelerated course for business owners. We actually just launched our latest co cohort. Uh, it's called the Digital Marketer's Edge. Uh, I'm really excited to say that we sold out yet again uh, we have 30 businesses, our capacity, uh, including uh, international businesses from Ghana and New Zealand. This is the first time we've ever had anyone from Africa or New Zealand as a part of the course. Uh, this adds to Europe, South America, and of course the United States is the continents that we've served. Um, I actually had a conversation with someone from Dubai uh, in the Middle East who's going to be joining in November. And um, the internationalization of BizHack has been one of the great surprises and joys to come out of moving online and COVID. Um, I did want to announce that we have opened up the application process for scholarships for our Digital Marketers Edge program. In order to apply, you just need to put in, uh, there's a brief application at try.bizhack.com scholarship. These are open to minority as well as women owned businesses, professionals of color and female entrepreneurs. If you're not sure uh, whether, you apply, whether you qualify, please apply and we'll have a scholarship info session in a few weeks here where we can talk about it. This is a partial scholarship for our November 2nd cohort, the last five week program we're gonna be doing this year. I did want to acknowledge our amazing partners, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association and Miami Marketers. Thank you guys for helping promote and bring folks uh, to this event. Um, and I did want to say that all of you are eligible, like myself, to become members uh, of Miami Marketers. It's a free group. Um, their Facebook group is right here. Uh, and I actually was part of their podcast, which uh, airs once a week. Uh, where they talk to different marketers in South Florida. It's a great resource and a great opportunity. So BizHack Live is taking a break next week, but we'll be back in two weeks with Cheryl Cattell talking about putting yourself into the shoes of your customer. I want to talk for a second about this. Cheryl is a consultant to BizHack as well as, as well as one of our lead instructors, as well as one of our marketing coaches. And I have seen her do this countless times where she's talking to you about your marketing and she'll close her eyes and she'll say, let me think about your ideal customer and what it would be like for them to encounter your landing page or your ad. And she'll close her eyes and she'll inhabit that avatar that we've developed, that persona. And then she'll say like, no, this isn't the right message. We really need to change the message to this. And I saw her do it so many times. I finally said, Cheryl, what you're doing for marketing is what actors do who follow the method acting approach. And I said, I want you to talk about that. How do you inhabit your persona as a marketer and then make sure that your messaging and your call to action and your offer is on point? 
And she said, it's a great question. I've never thought about it. Let me do a session for your community about that idea. And that's what method marketing is. It's a, it's a term that we kind of invented. Um, some other folks have used it before, but it's essentially how do method actors act? How do method marketers market? Uh, not to be missed. Cheryl is unbelievable. Uh, we do have um, Rosemary on the call today. Rosemary is coming back for an encore, uh, specifically to talk about her new Zoom score, which is a uh, trademarked uh, new offering of hers. Uh, and she's really become an expert uh, worldwide on how to master your presentation on Zoom. I can thank her for this set of flowers that I have up here, the nice framing I have of my uh, backdrop. Um, she helped me clean all of this up. She helped me buy the light that I have right there. Uh, can't recommend her highly enough. She's going to be promoting a couple of her upcoming Zoom mastery sessions that she has coming. And then finally, um, Alberto Pardo, also known as Banano, is the CEO of a company that does mobile marketing in Latin America. Latin America is one of the uh, richest, target, most target rich uh, markets, uh, easier and cheaper to reach your potential customers than in many other markets. They're incredibly uh, powerful to reach with Facebook and Google and um, Ads Mobile is actually a, uh, a mobile platform that Banano uh, founded and created to make it easier for you to reach your customers in Latin America through their cell phones, which they use at a much higher rate even than we do in the US. So really looking forward to that. We have another 10 sessions lined up for the rest of the year. Uh, they're all free, but if you did wanna just get it over with and sign up for all of them at once, we do offer a season pass for just $25 and you can sign up for them all. You'll get automatic reminders, calendar invites, and an email follow-up in which they, uh, in which we give you a recording. So in case you miss it, you have those resources. You'll also get any PDFs. You know, Dave is going to share two PDFs today, uh, and those are exclusive to people who register and attend for the events and become part of what you get as the season pass. Honestly, it's a great deal. Um, it does cost a lot of time and effort and money for us to be putting these on each week. We do want to do these as a free community service. So part of what you do when you buy a season pass is you support this effort uh, and get a lot of benefit in the meantime. Now, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to introduce Dave Bricker um, with a, uh, a little introduction that I wrote. Uh, I hope you like it. Um, I did want to also say that Dave and I uh, have been friends for a long time. Dave is also uh, an alumnus of the BizHack course, um, and he is one of the most um, potent combinations of expert storyteller and technically proficient marketing pro. Uh, really, really rare to see somebody who can configure an email and tell a story uh, and do both at the highest level of excellences. He's a multi-talented, uh, beautiful uh, marketer and storyteller. And I know you're going to love um, what you have here, what you're going to hear him talk about. Dave has spent 15 years sailing in search of stories. He's voyaged thousands of solo miles in sailboat and crossed the Atlantic on a gaff-rigged wooden yawl. Today, he teaches the art of business transformation through storytelling to writers, speakers, professionals, and visionaries. If you want to say it, share it, sell it, bring him your story, he'll help you tell it. So for today's special BizHack Live program, Dave will be casting off the dock lines, departing from his usual business content, and sharing a few sea stories just for the salty fun of it. Please welcome award-winning speaker, author, and transatlantic sailor, and pretty good jazz guitar player, Dave Bricker. January of 1992, a time when we were all a little younger. I was sailing, I was 25 years old, I was sailing a 26 foot boat from the Bahamas to Miami. And I had been away for 14 months. And on my way back, I stopped 
at a little island called Gun Key in the Bimini chain, and I waited for the weather in this bouncy, uncomfortable anchorage. And finally, I had my window to sail across the Gulf Stream. And you have to pick your weather very carefully when sailing across the Gulf Stream because it's like a river in the ocean. The current is flowing to the north. And if the wind blows the other direction, the waves look kind of like they would look if you dropped a watermelon in a bathtub. <clears throat> but I had this narrow window and I set off in the afternoon to sail through the night. And the first five or six hours of my sailing trip were glorious. This is the kind of sailing that you read about in those romantic adventure sailing books. But as night fell, the temperature fell and the wind came up a little bit. And then the temperature fell a little bit more and the wind came up a little bit more and it got dark and it got cold and it got windy and it got wet. And I took some sail down and I kept on going because what else was I gonna do? I needed to get home. And you don't wanna make a night landing in the Bahamas. There's too many rocks and things to miss. And I would have been back in that bouncy anchorage and I was six hours out, right? Out in the middle of the Gulf Stream. And I looked up to the top of my mast and I could see that my mast light was going dim. My batteries were dying and I was invisible out in these tremendous seas. And these were big seas, bigger than I had really seen before. And this is the only time I can remember tying a rope around my waist and lashing myself into the cockpit because I was taking these big warm waves over the cockpit, getting drenched, and then that cold air would get to me and it was warm and it was cold. And I kept on going, bouncing along because there was nothing else to do. And pretty soon I spotted some lights. And before long, my course converged with two freighters and a gigantic cruise ship, big cruise ships, big ships. And I thought, wow, there is no way these people can see these tiny, my tiny boat on their radars. They certainly can't see me visually. I, they can't see my light. I am invisible. And I watched very carefully, at least when I was on the top of the waves and I could see, and I dodged the two freighters. Have you ever watched a squirrel crossing the highway? They do this little dance and hopefully they pick the right, they usually get stuck in the middle of the road and take off at the last second. And this is how I felt. And I dodged the freighters and there's the cruise ship. And I set my course so I would cut right behind the stern of this cruise ship. And as I looked up at this ship, I could hear the humming, the, the, the engines of the big cruise ship. I was that close, I could hear the engines and I could see the flashing lights of the disco way up in the stern of the ship and the silhouettes of people dancing and this, this sound coming out of the back. Picture this. And I thought, my God, these people are having a very different experience in the same place at the same time. Have you ever felt that way in your business? Like you're out there on these big seas of, con of commerce, of business, and that there are these big ships going by in the night and you really need them to notice you. Those are those big clients you want. You want to be noticed, you wanna be paid attention to, and you're just little invisible you in your tiny boat in that gigantic ocean trying not to get run over. I think we've all felt that way. To me, the secret to getting noticed is storytelling. And I'm going to share some of that. I'd like to clarify that even though I told a story about myself, what I really did is I tried to tell a story about you. You would have listened for a few minutes while I talked about my sailing adventures. And then after a while, you would have decided that that wasn't really about you and that it might be fun and it might be interesting, but you've got some email to check. So what I did is I turned that story around and I used my story as a metaphor for your story, for your journey. And this is the point where if I'm doing my job right, you begin to pay attention. 
And stories are a magic tool for doing just that. Now, storytelling is not somebody coming and reading the three bears to your kids anymore. Storytelling is an in thing in business. It's a known business term. People are talking about it. There are buzz phrases like strategic storytelling and narrative strategy. There are plenty of storytelling courses. There are chief storytelling officers at IBM Watson and Verizon. A lot of big companies are now adding a C, uh, CSO to the C-suite, which is kind of interesting. And LinkedIn, last I checked, has over 25,000 people who have the words storyteller or storytelling in their title. So if you think this is a fluffy topic, it is no longer, it is a business thing. And there are workshops on storytelling. And hey, you happen to be attending one and that's all the validation I need today. Thanks for being here. Now, if stories are such powerful tools, and we know they are because we've all sat and watched a really horrible movie all the way until the end because we had to find out how the story ended. Stories are a tremendous hook. They pull us in, even if they're bad stories, but let's do a better job than that. If stories are such powerful tools, how come nobody teaches us what a story is and how it works and why it's so powerful, how to use it. This is some of the stuff I wanna talk about today. Some common questions I hear people ask me about storytelling. I know a good story when I hear one, but how do effective stories work? How do we get from the intuitive to having a method that we can use to polish our messages and grow our businesses with? How do I create a narrative that attracts and holds people's attention? Just watch TV commercials or look at advertisements on the web or in a magazine, and you'll see that only a small fraction of them actually capture and hold your attention. Why is that? Lousy storytelling. And of course, I love stories, but I'm not a storyteller. How can I find good stories and connect with clients and colleagues? And the answer to that one is simple. Size doesn't matter. You do not have to have sailed across the ocean or run a marathon or climbed Mount Everest. All you have to do is live a little life. If you have a child, if you own a pet, if you know that crazy stuff that goes on in the cube farm over and across the walls, you've got stories and your stories are big enough and powerful enough. The trick is to turn them into a metaphor for your listener's journey and not talk about yourself. The biggest question of all, how do I place my stories in the service of my audience? All things that we're going to cover. Let's take a moment and look at stories and how they work up here. It's pretty interesting. In evolutionary terms, we stepped out of the jungle 20,000 years ago, nothing. I mean, if you look at dinosaurs hundreds of millions of years ago, 10,000 years ago, people were still hunting mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. What we are today is just a few molecules deeper, a few molecules above what, what human history is. And as such, we are still hunter-gatherers at hearts. And our native mode of thought is to constantly scan the world for threats and opportunities. We are looking all the time. Stand on a street corner and look up. People are going to come beside you and look up and wonder what it is you are looking at. Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? If there's something big and heavy and burning that's falling, I'm going to run. That's a threat. If somebody dropped money off the fifth floor, I want to catch some bills. That's an opportunity. But when somebody's looking, when somebody's paying attention, we divert from that standard scanning mode. And what happens if I bore you during this presentation, you're going to check your email. You're going to look at Facebook or Instagram or something where maybe you've got a better opportunity to connect with somebody or find out what's going on in the world. That's where the opportunities lie. So as a presenter, as a storyteller, I will try to lead by example and keep things entertaining, but I wanna keep your attention. 
like I did in the beginning with the storytelling about being in the Gulf Stream. Paying attention takes us out of scanning mode and into the story. It's fascinating because part of your brain has been hijacked. When I took you into the Gulf Stream with me, part of your brain was out there in that boat with me, looking for threats, looking for opportunities. And unless you have experience with blue water sailing in a storm, the other thing that happened is subconsciously, I became the guide in the story. You were looking for me to lead that boat across the ocean, out of the storm, past the obstacles, and get us all to safety because you were living in my story. It's fascinating what happens. If you watch a movie, for example, you forget that you're sitting in a movie theater next to a bunch of people crinkling candy wrappers. I remember at least when it used to be that way in movie theaters, and we'll get there again. You forget, you are transported into the story. And the simplest, simplest of effective stories will actually do that for you. In the sailing story, I was your guide. In the stories that you tell, you will be the guide and not the hero, but we'll cover that. The method I'd like to share for how stories work, I call story sailing. I'm not sure where I got that idea. It just came to me, but, but here it is. And it's really quite simple. The number one rule, the golden rule of storytelling, write this down if you take nothing else from today's session. The golden rule of storytelling is that stories are always about people. They may seem like they're about talking animals. They may seem like they're about aliens, but at least metaphorically, they're always about people. If you're not talking about people, you're not telling stories. If you're not telling stories, you are not connecting. And if you are not connecting, you are not selling. And let me clarify, when I talk about selling, I know, especially for a lot of creative professionals, that's, that's the S word and we're uncomfortable with it. But anyone who's tried to put a child to bed is selling. Anybody who has applied for a job or asked somebody out on a date is selling. You're not necessarily selling products and services. You're selling your credibility. You're selling your suitability. You're selling your ideas. You're selling your trustworthiness. We are all selling all the time. And the key to doing that is to talk about people. Now, every story starts out on the rocky, stormy seas of conflict. Let's take the main character, or it could be a group or an organization, a company, for example, but let's just call that the main character. Let's put them out on the rocky, stormy seas of conflict. And what they want to do is they want to move from the seas of conflict to the safe port of transformation. Every story moves from conflict to transformation, but people are buying transformation. If you try to get somebody to stop smoking by showing yellow fingertips and teeth and burned lungs, it scares people away. Nobody is buying the conflict. But if you show somebody spending time with their grandchildren or finishing a 5K with a big ribbon breaking and their arms are in the air and they're happy, now you're selling the transformation. What happens if they buy your quit smoking program. So much advertising, so much marketing fails because they're selling the conflict. Now that conflict has to be authentic. We all want to make more money, but that's not the real conflict. Have you ever had an argument with a child and you say, Joey, it's time for bed. And Joey says, why? Well, because it's 930 and it's your bedtime. Why? Well, because that's what we do every night. Why? And you finally say, because I said so. And you become that parent you swore you would never become. But Joey's got some wisdom that we forget as we get older, because he keeps asking why, 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 until he gets to the bottom, th bottom of things. Why is it you want to make more money? Maybe you want to send your kid to school. Maybe you want to help a relative get an education. Maybe you want to take care of a health problem. It all comes down to these survival level things. Food, love, shelter, sex, status, all of these things that are pre-wired into 
the amygdala, the animal brain, if you will, the survival level things. If the conflict is not authentic, we tend to say, interestingly enough, that the story is not very deep. The person is not very deep. And it's interesting that the metaphorical depth correlates perfectly with this concept of authenticity. Now ask yourself, what else does a sailboat need to move from conflict to transformation? This is my favorite part. I call it magic here, but what is magic but a powerful invisible force? Wind, for example. You can't see it, but it's there, and it will blow you all around the world if you take the helm and navigate. And your magic is unique to you. It's your insight, your talent, your experience, your team, your equipment, your whatever it is that's unique about you. And again, we get into this idea of so many people start talking about the features, talking about, well, I'm a dentist. Well, great, you and a million other people are dentists. We know what dentists do, but maybe you've got a special touch with that needle that people aren't feeling any pain, or you're able to comfort people, or you specialize in false teeth that look just like natural teeth. Whatever your special talent is, is your particular magic. So get the labels off your business, the titles on your shingle. We know what dentists do. We know what doctors do. We know what plumbers do. What is it about you that blows your clients from conflict to transformation? That's the authentic story. Otherwise, you're just one of a million other people wearing the same label. Become a storyteller. Be the guide not the hero. In other words, blow that client from conflict to transformation. They're not interested in how you got from conflict to transformation. Solve their problem. The transaction is a byproduct. Forget the products that you sell, forget the prices on what you sell. The value that you are delivering to your client is really the product, your ability to solve the problem. And that is what defines the price of the solution. And the exchange of money happens after the exchange of stories, after somebody has decided that the story that you're telling is about them get yourself educated, get the presentation and communication skills that you need so that you can talk to a client, talk to an audience, talk to your boss, talk to your prospective date, whatever it is. These are learned skills that we generally don't learn in school. We generally don't learn them from our families. We have to go out and get these and find the coaches and mentors who will help you find your magic and make it powerful. Let's talk about some of the bogus stories that we tell so readily in our businesses. Some of the stories that don't work very well. Time is money. Yeah, we hear that one all the time. But anybody can sell hours. Hours are the most precious thing you have in the world. Whatever price tag you put on them, it's a bad deal. Anyone can offer a, pro a product or a service big deal. That's just a label. I do presentation skills and communications consulting. Somebody else offers dentistry or plumbing or whatever it may be. That's great. What is it that's unique about you? You have to find the clients who you can guide. It's not your product or service. It's your ability to blow them from conflict to transformation. Your product is a business outcome. Be the wind that blows toward transformation. Another story. Sure, you can have purple. How many in the creative professions have been in this conundrum? Professionals don't hire experts and then tell them what to do. This is my last blog post, and it's something we encounter all the time, where the client comes in and messes with, with the design or messes with the project specs, and you say, Sure, you can have whatever you want. The problem is, all of a sudden, you're not using your magic anymore. You're not going to deliver value. You're not going to deliver a solution that works. And even if the client is happy with it, 
you're not going to be happy with it. And in the long run, it's probably not going to serve them well. Huh, here's another of my favorites. Don't worry, that job will take five minutes. How many times have we done something for a client? And look, I'm not a greedy person. If I've got a, a, a client who's got business going and they just want something and I literally can do it in five minutes, happy to just do it and not charge them. It's about the relationship. I get it. But so often somebody needs things done that we think are easy. There's a story about Picasso, and I'm sure it's a fake story, but it's a great story where a woman came up to him in a marketplace and said, here's my napkin, will you draw a sketch on it? And Picasso, blah, 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 he drew his little sketch, and he was handing the napkin back to the woman and she grabbed it and he didn't let go of it. He said, that's going to be a million dollars, please. And she said, a million dollars, it took you 30 seconds. And he said, yes, but it took me 40 years to learn how to do it in 30 seconds. How long did it take you to learn the things that are easy for you to do? But what is the value for the client? That's what you're selling. And another one, if you don't understand this story, that's okay. Let's skip the techno babble. Clients don't want to hear about PHP and MySQL. They don't want to know about how it works. They want to know what the transformation is. What is it going to do for their business? If you try to sell them WordPress and plugins and themes and a Linux server and you lost them, that has nothing to do with what they're trying to do with their safe port of transformation. A data dump is not a story. The story of their business outcomes is the story. And the comfort that you provide by shielding them from all of the techno babble is worth more than the education that they don't want about the techno babble. They will pay you to know how, even if it's easy for you, because they don't care if it's hard or easy, they want it done so they can think about something else. One of the worst stories we tell in our businesses is I can do it cheaper. Maybe you can. Maybe you can compete with Pakistan and India and far away Astan, but competing on price is a race to the bottom. You do not have to be the cheapest. Great clients aren't looking for the cheapest. They're looking for the business result. As long as you can generate value in expertise of your fee, sell your value, expertise, and guidance for what it's worth. Excellent work is done for excellent clients. The ones who can't see past the price, send to your favorite competitor. Change the conversation from price to value. That's what storytellers do. And it's not so you can make more money. Well, it is, but it's so the client can get better outcomes. The client pays you more for a win-win. It's the perfect partnership. And those are the clients you stay with for years and years and they stay with you for years and years because you're helping them tell a better story to their clients. How many of you have thrown your arms up and said, my clients are such morons, but they're used to buying projects, not professionalism. They go to Upwork, they go to 99designs, they go to Fiverr and they buy, I need a logo, I need a website, I need a project. They are programmed to want pixels, not results. They don't understand that businesses are built on relationships and it is up to you to educate, enlighten, inspire and produce results in excess of your fees. It's up to you to switch the conversation from price to value. It will take a little bit of training, but the first part is the mindset that what you have to offer, no matter how easy it may be for you to provide it or execute it, is valuable to somebody. It solves a problem that could be worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, even if it takes you five minutes. Get the value that you provide. A few storytelling strategies. How can we take some of these concepts and embed them in our messaging so that we are a little bit more effective? One thing, and I've been harping on it already, is to sell outcomes. Let's take a real estate listing. Central Air, 8,000 feet, two blocks from the train station, rising property values in a desirable neighborhood. It's close to an A school. 
and it's close to downtown. Well, great. These are all features. They happen to be factual, but how can we take each one of these and turn it into an outcome that appeals to the prospective buyer emotionally? 8,000 square feet is a lot of square feet. Room for your growing family. That's hitting you in the heart where you care. Central air means you're comfortable during the summer. Close to the train station means avoiding traffic and parking hassles. Rising property values means you're going to recoup your investment. The desirable neighborhood means you get to grow your status and impress others by telling them that you live in XYZ neighborhood. Close to an A school is about taking care of your family. And close to downtown means you save time commuting. All of these factoids turn into benefits that make somebody say, yeah, that's gonna impact my lifestyle, my survival, my social life, everything. That's the home that I want to be in. That's the home that I wanna buy. One of my favorites, vote yourself off the island and explore the world in a U-boat. So much of our commercial language talks about ourselves and guess what? Nobody cares when we talk about ourselves. Narcissism is the only disease in the world where the sicker you are, the better you feel. Have you ever been this poor woman on the date with this guy here bloviating about himself? <laughs> he uses words like, I think, we're proud to offer this new whatever it is. Let me suggest something to you. Our company has 50 years of experience, blah, blah, blah. My product offers, blah, blah, blah. It's, look at these words, I, we, me, our, my. Get that stuff out and start talking about your clients instead of yourself. Vote yourself off the island and explore the world in a U-boat. Another very powerful thing that we can do to enhance our messages, written, spoken, on the web, on the page, on the stage, is to think about the verbs we use. Now, attending this workshop, if you were to see a typical listing for this presentation, you might get a list of what we're gonna cover. How stories work, stories are about people, your magic power, what is the outcome, how to put your story to work, writing the message and platform skills, and we'll do one more visual storytelling. So here we go, here's a list of uh, nouns. They're not gonna get anybody jazzed about coming to this. Let's activate all of these things. Instead of how stories work, we'll talk about learning how stories work, telling stories about people, using your magic power, selling results, putting your story to work, writing the message, developing platform skills, and using visual storytelling. But wait, there's more. Let's take these INGs off the end and let's also look at these verbs. Some of them just don't have a lot of emotional power. Using, putting, developing, using, boring. Let's use verbs as our spice cabinet when we write our copy and let's get rid of the INGs so that we have calls to action. Learn how stories work. Tell stories about people. Share your magic power. Sell results, not functionality. Inspire others with your story. Get rid of that put, it's boring. Craft your message, sharpen your platform skills, and master visual storytelling. All of those words on the left are calls to action. And the implication is that when I tell you to do them, if you don't know how to do them, I have just become the guide in your story. That's my sales pitch, and it's all about you. Being transparent about it. Find and share your magic. It's not about what you do. Someone else does what you do. It's about the how and the why. Why you do it? What motivates you? What's your passion? Offer your magic power. What is it that distinguishes you? Not is it not what is it you have the same degree you have the same credentials as someone else in your field it's your unique touch 
that people are going to buy. There is no competition because there is only one you. And that is how you put your story in the service of others, which was the most important question we wanted to answer today. How do you put your story, however big or small, in the service of others? I'm going to open the floor for questions in just a moment. I invite you to check out storysailing.com, which is my website. My phone number is there as well if you want to get in touch. And if you sign up for my mailing list, I will be happy to share with you a PDF of my book on virtual speaking called Speak Inside the Box. It's also available on Amazon if you want a hard copy. And I thank Dan and Lilia for having me. The BizHack folks have been uh, wonderful. Dan's been a great friend. I encourage you to check out the bizhack.com marketing course and to take some of these storytelling principles and use them to make the marketing that you create effective and punchy and attractive. Capture and hold people's attention by telling your story. Thanks so much for coming and I look forward to hearing your questions and I will answer any and all as long as they're not too tough. <laughs> uh, Dave, thank you so much for the kind words and for the amazing presentation. Uh, we're getting a lot uh, in the chat that I'm monitoring. Don't worry about it because I'm kind of responding to it. But I did want to invite people. Um, we're using a new Q&A format. Uh, you'll see on the bottom of your screen, uh, it says Q&A. Um, and right now, we only have one question from Sharon Holm. Uh, we'll definitely get to Sharon's question, but I did want to open the floor to get a few more questions before we go into the audience Q&A, because I have a couple questions of my own. Um, you know, this is a topic of particular passion and expertise of mine. I have a master's degree in storytelling from FIU. I studied all the greats from Joseph, Cam from Aristotle to Joseph Campbell to Carl Jung. Uh, and man, I'm excited to nerd it out with you a little bit here. Um, before we get to that though, I do want to nerd it out on a different level. This was a spectacularly produced presentation where you, I love you like shrunk yourself down to the corner and that you had live PowerPoint slides that were while you were, um, while you were speaking and presenting. Can you share with us what technology you use to deliver such a cool and innovative presentation format? Sure, well, as, as a storyteller and as a professional speaker, I, I have to go a little bit beyond the average webcam. So I have a camera switcher. There's a green screen behind me and lights for the green screen and lights on me. So I've got four lights in the room specifically set up to keep me separate from my background. And then I'm using a Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro camera switcher. My laptop is plugged into one of the inputs and that's what my slides are running on. And then my webcam is actually a, a camcorder, an HDMI camcorder that plugs into another one. And that switcher enables me to do the green screen, mix everything together. And I've got the lavalier microphone that's running through a, a USB interface and I'm working on upgrading that system as well. So I'm going a little bit beyond, but it's the camera switcher that lets me do the picture in picture. My slides are designed with room on the right. So what I can do is I can move myself down into the corner when I'm presenting and then click the full button and pop back up. It's full of tricks. I'm still learning it, but it's a wonderful tool for professional presenters. I like that it's a little bit more like me standing in front of a, a screen presenting instead of the, the separate boxes. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, just beautifully done. And how do you, um, the, the, the slides themselves, were those built in PowerPoint? The slides were built mostly in PowerPoint. I built the background. It's funny, I, I still love Adobe Fireworks, which is something Adobe abandoned long ago and I've avoided updating my operating system just so I can keep running Fireworks. That's funny. But 
you could use Photoshop, whatever it is. My MFA is in graphic design, so I'm fortunate to have some training and some skill in that area. So I create my slide decks. I do all the animation and stuff in PowerPoint, and that's a different workshop. But I, I try to be very deliberate about not putting 10 bullet points on the screen at one time so that while I'm reading bullet point two, I'm interrupting the audience as they read bullet point eight. You know, just, just controlling the flow and things like that. It's stuff I've worked on for a long time. Yeah. Now, one of your colleagues, mentees, someone that you do a lot of public speaking with is Rosemary Ravenall. And in a couple of weeks, she's going to be talking about Zoom mastery. Uh, and I know she's going to address, you know, how to make your background like mine look good. She'll probably address some of the technological elements of, that make you uh, kind of take it to the next level. Um, and so that's an exciting one. And I'll, I'll reserve more conversation around Zoom and the technology that you're deploying to that session so that we can dig into today's topic, which is storytelling. Yeah. And Rosemary, by the way, is a, is a dear friend of mine. She's a wonderful coach. And she, I mean, look, I go the technolo technological route because that's something I'm comfortable and familiar with. And I like geeking out about technology. But she's fantastic at just setting up a space and setting up a few lights and bypassing about 90% of the tech that I cross my fingers and hopes work. I hope it works every time. So she's got a little different approach to it. She's got a green screen and stuff too. She's familiar with that, but you'll enjoy her workshop very well. And I look forward to checking it out. Yeah, and just one other quick comment on this topic and then we'll dig into the Q and A. Um, you'll see back here that I have like my standing banner. Um, you'll see it prominently says in-person classes, which I obviously don't hold anymore. So we're gonna be updating this and you'll see a new backdrop in a few weeks. But um, one of the things that Bruce Turkel, our kind of mutual friend does, is he actually puts like a large post-it note and physically writes and draws and will stand up and do that. Another kind of cool technique for when you're storytelling. Uh, I mean, when you're presenting on Zoom. Um, and then I've even seen um, presenters use like virtual digital um, screens as well in there. Um, so Dave, a lot of the people who go through the BizHack program who are small business owners, micro enterprise owners, um, they and their business are one in the same, right? Like, so for BizHack, the Dan Gretsch story and the BizHack story have a lot of overlap. And we call this, in the context of our training, the story of me and then the story of us. And I'm interested in your perspective on micro enterprises, small businesses, limited resources, unknown brand, no staff, and how a story of personal motivation and then the story of problem that you're going to solve for your customer, how those inter, inter overlap and intersect? Well, as somebody who's been, for the most part, unemployable all my life, because I'm just interested in too many different things. <laughs> uh, now, and, and look, I, I taught for the art institutes for 15 years. I, it's not that I'm unemployable, but I'm very much that independent creative spirit. I have to be off on my own, constantly changing, constantly evolving, keeping myself from getting bored. But the real story, I mean, look, I, I have a sort of romanticized version of that story about how I sailed for 15 years in search of stories. It's true, but that wasn't something I ever did with the idea of, okay, I'm gonna do this and then build a business off it. It took me a long time to figure out how to leverage all of that stuff. And it was never my intention. It was just something I wanted to do because I met people who had great stories and damn, I wanted, you mean you can have adventures without going to the movie theater or reading Robert Louis Stevenson? I'm in. Get me, you know, get me on a sailboat. And, and off I went with $40 in my pocket and a locker full of food and dreams. It's all great storytelling. It's a conversation starter. But ultimately, by presenting that as the background for understanding stories, even the model, which is story sailing, it creates a theme and the idea is if somebody likes that theme and they get the whole thing, it all clicks together. And ultimately it's not the story of me, it's, it's the story of you. It's the story of the people who want to work with me, who relate to 
the way I'm presenting, the way I'm organizing my thoughts and concepts. And then there are other people who are just going to think it's either too woo woo or they like the desert and not the ocean. And, you know, those folks, should, some people should work with me. Some folks should definitely talk to Rosemary. It's, it's a story that's not designed to quote unquote hook everybody. It's, that's my story. And that's the way I, I spin it. It's still an authentic story. I really did go sailing all that time. I really did collect stories because that's what I wanted to do. And I really did find a use for them. But, you know, you, you create a certain mythos out of it. And I mean, I'm transparent about it. I don't have anything to pull over on anybody. That's, that's how it comes. That appeals or it doesn't. And the people to whom it appeals are the people you should work with. I love it. Yeah, you know, I believe that the story of me, the, the personal motivation for why you're in the business that you're in is a marketing differentiator for you in a crowded marketplace with well-heeled competitors. So if you get really in touch with why you do what you do and get good at telling that, it can help distinguish you from all the others out there. So um, that's one of the reasons that I think the story of me can be very helpful. But what I love about your emphasis is, is as, as uh, Brewster Kell's book says, it's all about them. So really making sure that the pivot is from story of me to story of us. If you're gonna talk about yourself, make sure that you connect how your personal journey connects with the needs, wants, desires of your audience. That's how I approach it. And this is why I call memoir writing the extreme sport for writers. Because if you're going to write 400 pages of your own story, you'd better do it in the service of your reader. Because nobody wants to read you, you know, me, 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 me. We're tired of it. We hear it every day. We watch the politicians. We watch business people. Everybody's talking about themselves. And all of, everybody's been on that bad day. And put your story in the service of other people. Talk about them. Stories are designed to connect us, not to distance us. Here's, um, we're going to do a little lightning round, Dave. So I'm going to give you, you know, try to answer in a couple sentences or less. Um, we have seven amazing questions, eight actually, and we're going to see if we can get through all of them before we wrap up, okay? I'm, I've been reading them. I can see them on the screen. And yes, I, can, I think I can get them very quickly. Yeah. Now, I, there's one that you don't see that was Sharon's. Uh, Sharon Holm asked, uh, you know, please touch base on storytelling for B2B, business to business, and B2C, business to consumer. I think it's the same thing, except that with B2B, you are very often helping your customer broker the relationship uh, with their customers. So it's kind of meta storytelling. So for example, if you're an advertising agency, you are working with your client to help them tell their story to their client, right? So, but the concepts are the same. You just have more stories linked together. Maybe I'm an advertising agency who specializes in travel. And that's the story that attracts a tour company to work with me and also gives me insights into who their customers are, people who like eco travel, something like that. If I was working with a company like that, and I have, I would map out both stories so that we see where they overlap and where they're different. Whereas B2C is you and the customer. Um, and they're not just business. It could be you and your partner. It could be you and your boss. It's the same model. It's conflict, it's transformation. If you're applying for a job, they wanna know what your qualifications are, but start telling them what you're gonna do for the company, for that business. That's why they're gonna hire you. Nice. Because they get a stack of resumes and half the people are gonna have better qualifications than you. Your advantage is the outcomes that you're gonna produce, not your degrees and your previous jobs. I love it. And I would just add that I think of marketing as people to people, not B2B or B2C. And so the, the principles of storytelling and of marketing are, are, are the same. All right. We're in a lightning round, Dave. So okay. you got to keep it short. Sasha Rabinsky, can you give examples of authentic versus inauthentic conflict? 
Okay, Dudley has his 16th birthday. The chauffeur drives him to the Porsche dealership and he wants a yellow 911, but his dad says you have to choose between red and black. Guess what? We don't care. It is not an authentic conflict because Dudley is an entitled little snot. We are not worried about poor Dudley unless he suddenly the light comes on for him and he starts thinking, oh, wait a second, there's more to this than what color Porsche I get. And he says, I'm gonna go out and sell news, you know, deliver newspapers and save up and buy my own Porsche. Now it becomes authentic. What is that survival level conflict that we care about? Yeah, so it has to be true and it has to have stakes. It has to be authentic, not necessarily true. We all love Harry Potter and it's not true at all, right? Yeah, there you go. We are, we are journeyists, not journalists. Nice. I, I have a journalistic background, uh, but uh, I have to forget that when I'm a marketer sometimes. Ralph Budd asks, uh, <laughs> Dave's thoughts on monohole versus multi-hole sailing. Nice. I'm going to be real quick because we could go off on a big tangent here. I love traditional monohull boats, but the way the hurricanes are piling up, you need a boat these days that you can go fast in. A monohull will go three or four times as fast. So if you are gonna be in the Caribbean or the Bahamas or wherever, and there's a storm coming, you can cover a lot more miles in a monohull. And it may be that the days of hanging out in the islands and having a storm or two come through every year are over big consideration. We can take that offline later if you want to geek out about sailing. For, for sure. Joel then uh, said, how would you incorporate your approach to storytelling with undergrad college students searching for their voice? And it's difficult because the undergrad college student generally doesn't have the big story yet. Very often they've been following a story that's been handed to them about expectations, what they want to do. Some of them are more mission driven than others. And where I would say is start off, life's going to teach you what to say. Start off by working on how to say it. And I think Toastmasters is a great place to learn presentation skills for almost anybody. Work on your writing, work on your speaking. Rosemary runs a fantastic Toastmasters group every Wednesday night at uh, wintoast, W-Y-N toast.com. It's free to come as a visitor. Check it out, Toastmasters, fantastic program. So if you're that younger part of your life and you don't know what your purpose or your mission is, that's okay. As you figure it out, at least you'll learn to talk about it. And then get off the sidewalk, step into the woods, explore those paths less traveled, give yourself, even if it's for a weekend, here and there, go camping, sleep under the stars, travel, do what you can to expose yourself to inspiring people, places, and ideas. Okay, we're still in the lightning round. Stephanie Miller, my buddy from NPR, are there metaphors that work better than others based on the type of outcomes desired? Honestly, I don't know. I think that there are cliche metaphors you know, for example, if someone tells me to think outside the box again, I'm going to you know, puke. There are some metaphors that are just so, it's great, but it's so overused, it's not effective. It's like saying that something is awesome. It's just not awesome anymore. I think if you can find something clever, the ones that your audience will relate to the most. Now, I don't know how many people in my audience today have been sailing, but if They've seen sailing on movies and they understand the metaphor of crossing a river, crossing a body of water, of making a journey. Something that's a metaphor for a journey that people can grasp onto intuitively is going to work better than your metaphor of the green door, the blue door, and the pink door. Maybe that's going to require too much explanation to work. That's my short answer. I, it's a good, I know these are tough, but I'm, we're going to get through all these questions before we wrap up. We'll go just a few minutes long. But um, one thing I'll tell you is uh, a very common mistake from beginning storytellers is to mix metaphors. So one thing you'll notice is Dave picked sailing and he creates a robust set of metaphors about storytelling based off of the metaphor of sailing. And, you, you know, you just you just want to be consistent across your metaphor. And then I came across a great metaphor recently about uh, that I want to share. BizHack's approach to teaching digital marketing is to start with Facebook advertising. 
even though Facebook advertising is just one small skill in the larger ecosystem of marketing your business online. And the reason, the metaphor that I've used to describe our approach is just like when you wanna learn a musical instrument, you start with the piano to learn your chords. Or just like when you wanna learn dance and you start with ballet to learn the movements. We have come up with an approach that Facebook advertising is the foundation of strong digital marketing knowledge. So that's, that's a powerful metaphor that helps really take a complex set of ideas and approaches and make it very uh, approachable. Right, so if you wanna learn Romance languages, you start with Latin, you study Latin. That's the root of all of them. If you wanna learn digital marketing, you study Facebook. So the metaphor would be Facebook is the Latin of, of <laughs> digital marketing platforms. I love it. In the biz hack universe. Perfect. Ruchita Despachande, how to tell someone else's story to have business buy-in to illustrate the differences that you have made? Well, it's great to tell stories of results that you've produced for other people. It's even better to have them tell the stories of the results you produced for them because it's one thing to brag about yourself, even if it's a legitimate accomplishment. If you can get somebody else to brag about you, that hits people much more deeply. But there are plenty of stories you can tell about people who have accomplished fantastic things. You can talk about how Winston Churchill was the spirit of England during the Blitz and he kept people fighting and kept people bound together with his speeches and his spirit. Now, that's something that you, a story that you could tell to a leader. It's not your story. You never helped anybody through being bombed night after night after night. I mean, if you did, fantastic. And if you didn't, even more fantastic for you, right? You never had to deal with that. Imagine the burdens on him at the time. So you can tell stories of leadership that inspire people and they don't have to be your stories. Stories are stories. Joel Van Kuyken, we often hear about the hero's journey as a storytelling archetype. Can you speak to this idea and how it impacts your process? And maybe give a quick definition for those the, who don't know. The hero's journey is Joseph Campbell's sort of 12 part uh, journey that explains how a story works. The Star Wars is a perfect hero's journey and it goes through all of these steps. I find that the hero's journey has way too many moving parts and it's better for movie scripts than for a lot of other things, which is why I like the four part model. Now I still talk about being the guide versus the hero. There are little bits that I've borrowed from Campbell, but all you really need to make a story work is from conflict to transformation. Whereas the hero's journey, you have the, all of these different things where the hero's minding their own business and then the circumstances change and then they meet the teacher and then they go on the quest. Well, some stories work that way and there's a whole mythological, psychological aspect to that based on Carl Jung, but it gets really dense. And if you try to read it, you make sure there are no guns around. It's really difficult to read and uncomfortable. There are some great animations on YouTube explaining the hero's journey, but I've been very happy with story sailing. I've pressure tested it in just hundreds of different situations and it's simpler and more practical. And we're not writing movie scripts here. Maybe we're writing a tagline or, or ad copy. And here's one other thing I'll say from a, from a nonprofit or social justice perspective. The hero's journey is about somebody who is knocked out of their normal day-to-day -day existence and has to overcome uh, usually a life-threatening or really significant challenge in order to make it to the other side uh, and see home for the first time, as T.S. Eliot put it. Uh, so it's really about um, overcoming a life-threatening challenge and being changed in the process. Now the problem with the hero's journey is the idea of a hero. And sometimes there are people who are defeated by circumstance or life, right? Like only one in a hundred poor folks walk over crack vials and end up going to Harvard. And there's an implicit blame for the 99 others that are living through those difficult circumstances and don't get into an Ivy League school. And so in a lot of storytelling um, circles, 
when you're dealing with social justice issues and issues of like institutional racism or challenges that are not easy to solve, we talk about a model where at the end of the journey, they decided to tell their story, to bear witness. And that that's a way to get around the heroification, which sometimes implies blame for the folks who are victims who don't overcome those circumstances. Guillermo Younger is gonna take us out with his last question. Dave, you are a coach and a speaker and you excel in both arenas. What are you more passionate about? Great question, I'm gonna change the question because to me it's all story selling, uh, uh, storytelling, story sailing. And I think as I, I love an opportunity to get in front of an audience and share because you're dealing with the energy of a whole lot of people at once and it's kind of a rush and it's possible to offer value to more people at the same time. I love doing that. It's part of what I do. I probably do more coaching and very often I speak because it attracts people who want that coaching. And then it's both sides of the coin. It's what do you say and how do you say it? And very often someone will come with a loose message and we'll break the script down line by line. We'll do a lot of story work. We'll make sure there's a good hook at the beginning to grab the audience's attention. What is the outcome? You've got to be very clear about the transformation or your boat's just going to ramble around in the middle of the ocean and not find any place. And once we get that together, then we can get into those delicious pauses and where you move close to the camera and where you get farther away and all of the stagecraft that makes that message. How do we take it from, from the page to the stage or the page to the stage to the screen, whatever the case may be. And to me, it's all part of that grand art of storytelling. And I love all of it. Well, I am so grateful to you and also to those great questions uh, questions that I would never have thought to ask, and I was fascinated by the answers to. Um, Dave, thank you again. Um, any final words or, or anything that you wanted to share before we close uh, today's session? No, Dan, thanks so much for, for having me on your program. It's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you to all the people who showed up and stayed on. I think that's a good sign. So thank you all. Get in touch if I can be in value. My phone number again is 305-490-5998. My website is storysailing.com, and if you forget that, you can get there through davebricker.com, and... Let me know what your storytelling challenges are. Reach out if I can be of value. You know, we've gotten a lot of comments about how brilliant Dave is, and I'm happy to say that while he is extraordinary, uh, we also have amazing, brilliant marketers coming up. Two weeks from now, we have Sharon, uh, Cheryl Cattell. Three weeks, we have um, uh, Rosemary Rabinal, who is a part of today's session and leads the Toastmasters group. And, uh, and then the week after that, we have Bonanno, Alberto Pardo from Ads Mobile, talking about the Latin American market, one of our favorite topics. We're so grateful to you, our BizHack community, for being here week after week and supporting us. Uh, and with that, I'll say, join us next week. Um, check out our five-week course coming up in November. And thanks so much. Bye, everybody.